Okay, thank you for the confirmation. Uh, I just want to say uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. It's very nice that we can have these talks uh, uh, everywhere now. Uh, my name is Corey Osis. I'm a postdoc here at Duke working with Professor Cuderolo. Um, We're going to start off the, um, the session here, the first one after the keynote, uh, really going back to the basics. Uh, uh, we're going to introduce the uh, density functional theory, um, and we're going to the, we're going to build off of uh, uh, um, the 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 software framework of VASP, uh, which is the Vienna Ab Initio uh, uh, um, uh, software package here for running density functional theory calculations. Um, I want to say that we're going to do an introduction of DF to density functional theory. This is uh, this is really uh, coursework that could be done over over the course of uh, of many um, uh, uh, many semesters. Um, but we're really just going to do an overview today uh, um, for, for, you know, basically the idea. Corey, sorry for interrupting. It looks like you're showing the presenter view instead of the. Ah, okay. Thank you for, for letting me know. I'm going to swap. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know, Dr. Esters. Okay, so um, we're going to, so, so we're going to have an, an overview today. The idea is very simple. It's the idea that we want to we want to be able to drive the car. So imagine that you know we, we're going to do an introduction that's that's similar to um, what you would understand of the car if you were driving the car, not necessarily from the perspective of you know the 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 mechanic to fix the car, right? So an overview of of, of how the car works. That's the idea here. Okay, so we're going to start off with um, okay. So I want to start off with the mission of the talk today, and I think we've gotten good uh, inspiration from from a paper of Dirac. This paper was, was written in 1929. It's called Quantum Mechanics of Many Electron Systems. And I'm gonna read a short excerpt, um, which sets the tone for today. Uh, the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations that are much too complicated to be soluble. It, is, it therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed and can, which can lead to an ex explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. Now, again, notice that this paper was written in 1929. And since then, this has been our mission is to come up with uh, uh, reasonable, uh, efficient ways of, of, of calculating the properties of materials um, and it's a very difficult problem, okay? This is really where the engineering component, where we, we diverge from the physics aspect and we go into the engineering of the problem. Okay, so, all right, here we go. So <clears throat> we have, um, here we start off with the time independent many body Schrodinger equation. Um, we have a wave function, which understands the, it has the information of all the particles in the universe. We have the coordinates of the electrons, coordinates of the ions, um, and we have an operator acting on it, which is called the Hamiltonian operator. And this operator is gonna yield the energies of the system and return back the, uh, the, the wave function. Um, this operator has a number of components, I'm gonna break it up, but essentially it captures the energies of all the relevant pieces of the wave function. So here we have kinetic energy of the electrons. We have the kinetic energy term of the nuclei. We have the interactions between the electrons, the intera interaction between the, the electrons and the nuclei, and then the nuclear-nuclear interactions. So this, uh, this, uh, um, this problem is already very complicated. I'm gonna show some, 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 uh, um, some reasons why this is, this is uh, virtually impossible to solve exactly. Um, but we have the, the, the main, one of the major problems is that we have this entangled wave function, with all the particles in the, in the universe, okay? So we're going to take a number of approximations to reduce this problem down into something that we can solve. The first approximation, um, which is almost always taken, is called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, also called the clamp nuclei. The idea is that we have the protons, the nuclei, that are very big, very heavy with respect to the electrons. And the fact that they're so big and that the electrons are so small, you have a factor here of about 2,000 just re with respect to the, um, to the mass, um, we, can, we can treat the nuclei as if they're not moving. 
Um, the picture I want you to have in your head is that if you're on the, if you're driving on the highway, you might have noticed, you know, sometimes you see these, these motorcycles that come whizzing by, right? They come by and they come by very quickly. Um, from the perspective of the motorcycle, they're moving so fast that it looks like the cars are themselves not moving. So they're whizzing, they're going in and out of lanes. Um, dangerous, I don't recommend it. But the idea is that the, from the perspective of the motorcycle, everything looks like it's standing still. So if the nuclei are not moving, then the kinetic energy is zero here for the nuclei, and the nuclear-nuclear interactions becomes a constant. Okay, so we can reformulate our problem here to be, uh, uh, we can take our, our Hamiltonian and really just focus on the electrons. Okay, so we just have the terms that are focused on the electrons. The energies now become the energy of the electrons that comes from the Hamiltonian here, plus this constant electron-electron nuclear, uh, nuclear, nuclear, in a uh, um, electron term that comes from this term here, okay? Okay, so now we, we reduced our problem down, but we still have, uh, um, we still have a big problem of dimensionality. Um, and so we need to solve this, this entangled wave for this wave function, uh, this many, many body wave function here, which has three n coordinates and it's very expensive. Computational gr cost grows exponentially with dimensionality. So we have our grid here where we're solving our Schrodinger equation at every point in this grid, and it's exponential with the number of electrons. So let's give some examples. I'm gonna give some cost factors relative to uh, an electron in one dimension. So if we wanna solve um, uh, the Schrodinger equation for a carbon dioxide molecule, and we have a, gr a three-dimensional grid with 10 points in every direction, we have 10 to the three here, and then we have three dimensions and we have 22 electrons. So this is a factor of 10 to the 198. Okay, so this is very expensive. It's intractable, the problem. We have a nano cluster of hundred platinum atoms. Uh, um, we have, we have, again, the same factor here for the grid. The three here, we have 78 uh, electrons for platinum and then hundred times for the nano cluster of hundred atoms. So it's 10 to the 70,000, okay? These are really intractable numbers. It really cannot be done. So how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Well, this is where DFT comes in, okay? Now there's two major theorems that I'm gonna discuss here. I'll just give a brief overview, but these, this is really groundbreaking and it's allowed us to, to move forward with this problem. And really uh, um, it's, it's taking the problem from intractable to something that we can do nowadays with, with modern computers. So the first theorem that I'm gonna discuss was derived by Holmberg and Cohn in 1964. And the idea is you can think of it as a very broad coarse graining uh, approach. So the energies is really what we're after here, okay? The energies are a functional of the wave functions, which depends on all of the, uh, which has information of everything, all the coordinates of the electrons uh, everywhere in space. Well, Holmberg and Cohn showed that you can change the basic variable from the wave function to the charge density, which only has three coordinates, okay? Now, this, is, this, is, this derivation is actually quite simple. You can go back to the paper and it's actually a very simple derivation. However, they don't tell us the exact form of the equation. So while it was a groundbreaking concept, the fact that you can reduce down uh, the, you can coarse grain and reduce down the dimensionality, we don't have a practical form with which to work and to solve our problem here. And that's where we go to the second theorem, which was uh, developed a year later by Cohn Sham. And they offered a useful reformulation. Okay, so here we have the energies, which is gonna be equal to, um, we, have, we have our wave function, we have our, our operator, the Hamiltonian, and we have to multiply the complex conjugate of the wave function and integrate everywhere in space, we get back the energy. Um, we have three terms here. We have the kinetic energy, which is now in terms of the charge density. We have the electron-electron interactions, and then we have the nuclear-electron interactions, which is kind of the external potential applied to the electrons, okay? Now this formulation, which is dependent on the charge density now, this is implied by uh, holmberg cohn okay? Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're going to, this, this problem is very difficult to solve and there's a number of reasons, I'm gonna go through them in a second, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna break up these terms into pieces that we can solve 
and we're going to push all the pieces that we don't know into a term that we basically call the garbage collection. Okay, so the idea, one of the major issues with solving this problem exactly is the fact that we have these electrons that are moving at relativistic speeds and at every time snapshot, we need to solve the instantaneous Coulomb repulsion between all the electrons, between each electron and all of the other electrons. That problem is very difficult to solve. Um, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of encapsulated in what's called the correlation energy, okay? Um, but basically what we're gonna do is, okay, so let's start off with our first term here, the kinetic energy. We're gonna split this off into two terms. One term that we, we can understand, which is the kinetic energy of a, of a very similar problem, which is N non-interacting particles. Okay, so we have in the real problem, we have N interacting problem uh, particles. All of the interactions are happening instantaneously. We're gonna solve a different, a slightly different problem, which is N non-interacting particles. So we have that piece here. We have the piece of, of, the, of, the inter, of the instantaneous interactions between the electrons, which is called the classic Coulomb energy, which, is, which you can think of as the electron, instead of the, uh, the electrons interacting with all of the other uh, electrons, we're gonna have the electron interacting with a constant background charge, okay? And that's what that term is here. We have our external potential here, that term just comes right down. And then all of the pieces that we can't solve goes into this, this one term here, which is called the exchange correlation functional. And so that term, as I said, collects all of the pieces we don't know. So that's the full kinetic energy minus this other kinetic energy of, of a different problem, but very similar. And then we have our electron-electron our -electron interactions, and then we subtract off the uh, classic Coulomb energy that I described previously. It accounts for a few different things. So. Um, we have a residual kinetic energy. We have exchange energy, which is uh, um, exchange arises out of the fact that electrons are identical particles and that their fermions have anti-symmetric wave functions, okay? So it's basically the energy released when you have, uh, um, when you have two same spin electrons swap electrons within degenerate orbitals of a subshell, okay? We have our correlation energy which is this, this, uh, this difference between this picture that we have in our head of all the electrons interacting with each other and then the electron interacting with the constant background charge. And then self-interaction. We have an electron interacting with a constant background charge. Well, this constant background charge also includes the electron it's interacting with. So there's kind of a double counting there, our self-interaction term. So this exchange correlation term captures all of these let's call it errors or, or discrepancies that we're not quite capturing with our picture here, our simpler picture here. Simpler picture is very important because what it offers us is, uh, um, it offers us the uh, canonical cone sham equations, which are N1 electron equations. And these look very similar to the, uh, the Schrodinger equation I showed you earlier, we have a Hamiltonian op operating on our orbitals here. And that's gonna give us back the energies of our orbitals times the orbitals themselves. It looks like our typical eigenvalue problem, but it's subtly not, okay? Subtly in a very important way. It's actually a non-linear eigenvalue problem because the operator that's acting on the orbitals here actually depends on the orbitals themselves, okay? So this, this dependency on the thing that it's acting on complicates the problem. And the way to solve it is, is, is a, we have to solve this iteratively. When we look at the vast ones later, you're gonna see this, this, uh, this, uh, these steps, um, and it, it's, it, you're gonna see these steps written out to what's called the Aussie car, okay? And the idea, the idea here is that what we're gonna do in order to solve this problem iteratively, we start off with a trial solution, okay? Some sort of random initial solution to the problem, which we call the trial solution for our, our orbitals. We plug that solution into our operator, okay? So we take that solution, that, that initial trial solution, we solve for the operator, effectively fixing this term. Then we solve the problem as if we had an eigenvalue problem. We, we now have a fixed operator operating on our orbitals and we're going to uh, solve this eigenvalue problem for the wave functions. 
and the and the and the wave of value, the the eigenvalues, the energies. And once we get that solution, we're going to see how different the, the solution we get from our eigenvalue problem is and the one that we plugged into the operator. And this is what we, we get into this iterative loop. While these two solutions are different, we're going to take the solution we solved and we're going to plug it back into our operator, fixing the operator, and then solve the eigenvalue again. We do this back and forth, back and forth until the two solutions are effectively the same, until they converge. Okay, so that these are the basic ideas of DFT. Okay, we're going to go into some of the details in a bit, but let's go back to our original problem. How does this help us with our curse of dimensionality? Well, instead of having this exponential term with the number of electrons, we now have something that really scales uh, linearly with the number of electrons. So now we have a, a, a multiplicative factor here. This still, we still have a big problem because for materials, we have we have. We have something like moles of electrons, okay? So we still have a big problem here. We can reduce this down with another approximation, um, which is that we're working with crystals, with, with something that is infinitely periodic, okay? So periodicity is the next major approximation. And it's important that we understand what periodicity is because periodicity is gonna have big uh, consequences for how we solve the, the, the problem here. Periodicity means that we have our macroscopic material. Think of the, you know, the mug you're drinking coffee out of or the table you're, you're, you have your computer on. If it's really, if it's, a, if it's a perfect crystal, then we can reduce the unique information of this material down to a, a microscopic or nanoscopic crystal, which are a unit cell where the unique information is contained. And this unique a unit cell is repeated everywhere in space. Okay, so this, this, this repeating unit, we're going to talk about the translational periodicity. Here we have our, our, our lattice vectors. Okay, so A1, A2, A3. So every single piece of the material is a building block. Think of Legos. And you can, you can translate yourself in, every, in all three dimensions, and you'll find an equivalent unit cell. Okay, so <clears throat> when you think of periodicity, Whenever you hear periodicity, you should immediately go to Fourier transform and plane waves. Okay, so that's where your mind should go. So we're going to be solving our solutions here in terms of plane wave basis. Okay, so an exponential times uh, the imaginary times this block vector times our, 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 our lattice vectors. Where this K, this block vector lives in the frequency domain, right? So we've heard of, of Fourier transforms with respect to um, in like music where we have, you know, you have time and then you have the frequency domain, which is one over time. Now we're, in, we're doing a, a periodicity in space where we have meters and we're going to be looking at the reciprocal space, which is something like one over meters. And, and the idea here is that we have our lattice vectors here in real space. And we're going to we're going to look at what the reciprocal space is, which is uh, another unit cell. Okay, this is the first Brillouin zone. So instead of having our unit cell in the re real space, we're going to be talking about the Brillouin zone in the reciprocal space. And we can derive these uh, uh, lattice vectors in the reciprocal space uh, very easily. They come from the relationship between the reciprocal and the real space. Okay, so. The, the idea here is that because we have a periodic system, the solution for the energies of these electrons is itself going to be periodic, okay? So if we, have a, we, have a, we have a function here, which is periodic, okay? So we shift by one of these lattice vectors. We're gonna get our solution in terms of the plane waves times a, 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 a periodic uh, uh, um, uh, term here, okay? So this term here, is periodic with the lattice. Okay, so we have our another term here, which is uh, uh, again in terms of plane waves. But notice that instead of big R here, we have a term little r, which is within the unit cell. Okay, and this lattice periodic term here means that if we shift by our lattice vectors, we're going to get back the same function. Okay, so we embed that information into the solutions for our energies of our electrons. Okay, so some important notes here. The, the block vector is constrained to the first Brion zone. That is where all of the unique information is. You can think you can talk about the second Brion zone, the third Brion zone, but effectively the unique information is contained within the first Brion zone. And if you look at the smallest 
uh, of Brion zone, you're really talking about the Wigner Zeit cell. Okay, so that is the, the primitive cell of the Brion zone. N here, which I haven't talked about, and N here is the band index. It's going to be something of the order of the number of electrons in the system. Um, and you're going to see, we're going to talk about later what, the, what this band index refers to, but these are basically different solutions, the different bands in the, in the, in the uh, electronic structure. Um, and we can actually solve for what these, uh, um, we're basically building up our solutions as an infinite series of these Fourier transforms, okay? So these plane waves, this is what the Fourier transform gives us. So we can build up this infinite series, which we're going to truncate, practically speaking. And our, our, our eye on the, the, to keep our eye on the ball, we want to solve for the coefficients of these plane waves, okay? Now, these coefficients, we can actually look at where they're, where they're written in VASP. They're written to what's called the wave car. This wave car is a binary file because there's many, many, many uh, um, terms that we're going to have in our basis here. And usually we don't write this file out because it's so big. We're talking about gigabytes of space. But if you're interested in seeing these coefficients, they're written out to the wave car when you're working with VASP. Um, now, if in the ideal world, we would have uh, uh, an infinite series, but we're going to truncate this practically speaking. And the truncation, we can actually the, we can actually write out how we truncate this series. And it, the basis that's basically going to be truncated. Um, with respect to an energy cutoff, okay? And so we're going to talk about how this energy cutoff is defined. It's going to be well, with respect to our pseudopotentials. And, and it depends on which elements we're talking about, which pseudopotentials we have. But keep in mind that the energy cutoff dictates where we truncate the, uh, the basis set for, the, for, the, for the, um, the, the plane waves. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to be, we have a grid over which we're going to be solving uh, um, we're going to be basically solving for the energies of our system here. Um, and so any of the relevant properties, you know, well, we're going to be talking about charge density, density of states, all these different things. We're basically these things, these, these concepts over which we're going to be over, which we're, we're interested in solving. These are, these are going to be integrated over the Brion zone. Okay. So we're going to solve it for a particular K points over these block vectors and then we're going to do a big integration, and that's going to give us, for instance, our charge density. Okay, so uh, we have our integral here, and our charge density here. We have our occupancy, right? This is the Fermi-Dirac uh, uh, function here. And then we have our wave function squared, okay, the, or the orbitals here in this case. Um, the idea here is um, we're going to convert this integral over the Brion zone into a discrete set of K points. Okay, and, and, and if the idea seems kind of foreign to you, think, I want you to think, you know, go back to, 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 uh, to first or second year of calculus when we derive the trapezoidal method. Okay, so we converted our integral here into a sum, right? And so we have, we're going to be solving our, our integral over, over a bunch of trapezoids, which effectively model the, we're going to do, we're going to look at trapezoids and we're going to sum over the area. And effectively speaking, what we've done is we've converted our integral into a sum where we solve for the function inside of the integral at very special places inside of our bounds, okay? And so we solve f at particular x and we sum. That's exactly what we're doing here. Um, now, this question of where we pick in the k-point grid or where to sum, this is a very important question. How do we define our grid? So in VASP, uh, there's a few different settings. Broadly speaking, we have these automatic schemes. Um, one is called the Moncourse Pack or Gamma Center. They're, they're actually not all that different. And, and, and for very important reasons, we're generally going to pick the Gamma Center. Um, this used to have a big impact back when um, you know, resources of computers were a little more limited. Now in day, now, nowadays, the difference between Moncourse Pack and Gamma Centered is really not a big deal. And I'm going to generally uh, uh, suggest that you go with Gamma Centered. So there's one scheme where you have an automatic scheme that VASP will build the grid for you. And then there's a second scheme where you can build your own uh, um, uh, grid for yourself and solve it in, in, in particular points of space. And that's going to be important for us when we look at the band structure, because we're only going to be looking at very, we're going to look at a very particular path along the, 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 the band structure. Okay, so um, 
Uh, the, the idea here is that we're going to be building a grid, equally spaced grid, along all three dimensions in K-space. Um, and, and this grid um, is the, the difference between Moncourse Pack and Gamma Centered is whether we include this, the origin. Okay, Gamma is the origin in reciprocal space. So Moncourse Pack, as it's defined, this grid does not include the origin. It's offsetted from the origin. But otherwise, just imagine a 3D grid. And you're going to be solving the, the at every single point in this grid, you're going to be solving for uh, your orbitals and your wave functions and your energies. Um, but we want to include the grid for very important reasons. Okay, so let me give you an example of what we have here. Visualize here, we have a 2D grid. Um, and we have 16 points. So we're going to have a 2D grid. We're going to look at four points in that grid. So that's 16 grid points total. Okay. Um, now, the irreducible part of this grid is really just this wedge here. Okay. Symmetrically speaking, everything else is degenerate in with respect to uh, uh, this grid, this, this, uh, this very important wedge here. Okay, so we look at, here we have our, our uh, reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2. Here we have four points inside. And if you look at um, what we're doing is that we want to solve at every point here what the uh, orbitals are, what, what the orbitals are at every one of these points. And we're going to take a very special weighting at all of these points, and we're going to do a sum. Okay, so we're going to do a sum over what the values are of the function at every one of these points, and then they're going to be weighted. So the question is, what is the weighting? Well, the weighting here we have, we can see here that K1 and K2 look very similar here. They're, they're, they're going to have equal, they're going to have equal weighting because they represent uh, four points that are degenerate all over the space. So K1 here, this point here is degenerate to this point here this point here and this point here. So the weighting is four out of 16 or one fourth. It's the same for K2. K3 is equivalent to K3 and K1. Okay, so really you're gonna have this point and this point, this point and this point, which sums up to eight. Eight out of 16, so the weighting is one half. So now this is how we perform this sum. This integral here is converted into a sum where we solve for the function inside at each of these points and then we have a respective weighting. Okay, so that's what I want you to remember when you're doing these calculations. Now, <clears throat> I said that the origin, whether we include the origin or not, there's going to be some problems if we don't include the origin, and this is why. So here we have uh, um, we have a, a, a hexagonal lattice, okay, and and we're going to put a grid right on top of that lattice, okay. So this is the symmetry set up by by our crystal, and the idea here is that. If, um, if we had a grid that was, was, was well fitted for this particular uh, unit cell, then if I took this grid and I rotated it by 60 degrees, you know that 60 degrees is an important angle here for this, uh, this, this unit cell, then I should get a grid that maps exactly on top of itself. And what happens here, because I don't include, because the grid doesn't sit exactly at the origin, it's offset. What happens is that when I perform that operation, I'm going to get more grid points. And we basically get an explosion of calculations that are required, okay, of, 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 of places where we need to solve uh, um, our, our cone sham orbitals. So uh, you basically, the idea here is that the grid and the unit cell, the symmetries are not commensurate. And so what, the solution is very simple. We just need to shift our grid to the origin. Once we shift it to the origin and we perform that same rotation, now all the grid points are going to map back to themselves. We don't get this explosion and everything is, is fine and happy. Issues where you're definitely going to have, or, or rather unit cells, symmetries where you're going to, definitely going to have this issue, includes FCC, hexagonal, rhombohedral. These are places where you're definitely going to want to have gamma centered. But in general, we recommend always having gamma centered because the, the difference between gamma centered and not is really trivial at this point. So gamma center is always safe. Um, okay, now uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of an important topic in VASP, uh, or, um, which is the pseudopotentials. And the idea here is that our plane waves need to model every part of the atom, okay? So you, you can imagine what you're going to have here is that, you know, if you have your atom and the electrons, you're going to have some electrons, which are the core electrons, which are very close to the atom. 
they're going to have these very high energies because they're interacting very closely with the with the atom, right? So these electrons are really bound, and the, these interactions are very high energy. Okay, with respect to plane waves, what that means if if you have high energy, you're going to have a lot of nodes. Okay, so I don't know if you if you learn this when you're doing Fourier transform, but with the plane waves, if you have a high energy. Uh, um, um, if you're describing something that has high energy, you're going to have a lot of curves and kinks in these plane waves. Okay, this is going to describe these high energy, energy re interactions. Now, far away from the uh, atom, from the nucleus, you're going to have electrons, which are called the valence electrons, and that's really where the chemistry is happening, right? The bonding. Um, now, these electrons, uh, these ele to describe these electrons, you're going to have fewer nodes because the, in the energies are not going to be as high as the core. So the problem here really comes down to that you kind of have two different pictures uh, that you need to model with the same plane waves. And, 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 it, and really what happens is that if you want to model this exactly, it's going to be very, very expensive. And really, practically speaking, you cannot do this exactly beyond lithium. Okay. And so what we do here is we cut our, we have, we basically slice our, our picture here. And, and this, this slicing here, spatially speaking, is called the, the cutoff radius. And this cutoff radius is going to define where we, we're going to have two different pictures. We're going to model the core electrons very as well as possible. And then we're going to have a picture for our valence electrons. And so we're going to replace this core piece here with an effective potential. That's our pseudo potential. Um, and then we're going to really worry about solving the, the, the place where the bonding is most important, the valence electrons. Now, where, how we shift this radius and where we, we start to kind of do an effective potential instead of modeling it exactly, this, this, this is going to define how transferable our pseudo potentials are. So if this cutoff radius is very big, the calculations are going to go a lot faster because we've, uh, we're reducing a big part of it with an effective potential. But this is going to make uh, uh, these pseudo potentials less transferable. We're not going to be capturing some of the relevant bonding that we're interested in in these very specific scenarios. So if you have a very large cutoff radius, this makes the pseudo potential softer. That's where that term comes from. So if you hear soft pseudopotentials, you know that, that you're, you've basically reduced down a lot of your picture to an effective potential. Um, with regards to VASP, um, we're going to be talking about the projected augmented wave method for creating pseudopotentials. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of details here, but the idea here is that we have our exact solution and we're going to be replacing that exact solution with various pieces that where we're really within those pieces, encapsulated in those pieces, we're gonna to try to solve our solution exactly. And then outside of that piece, we're replacing with an effective potential. So here you can think we have, we're, we, we have a piece here, which is concerned with the environment, right? The valence electrons here where the bonding occurs. We're gonna have a piece here, which is worried about the edges, the radial grids. And then we're gonna have a piece which is concerned with the inside. And outside of those respective scopes, we're going to be modeling with an effective potential. Okay. Um, and then we can combine this with a well-calculated frozen core approximation, which is, which is something you'll hear about in the literature. Now, this projector augmented wave method, this is very important for VASP. And it's really the reason that people use VASP. This, this approach is very, it's, it's very effective. And, and it's been very well done um, and implemented within VASP. And this is the reason why VASP is so popular. Okay, so you use this really for these pseudo potentials. The last topic I want to cover is um, change correlation functionals. Before we get into the practice, I'm just going to cover it from a, from a very broad perspective. There's a lot of ways that we're going to model that, 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 can, that we can model this, this garbage collection term. Okay, the first that's important is called the lo local density approximation, where the exchange correlation term is going to be dependent on just the local density. Okay, um, and this local density we derive is the exchange and correlation per particle of a uniform electron gas. Okay, and what it does is that since it assumes that all the all the charge density is equally distributed everywhere in space instead of these instead of you know, in some cases we can have uh, uh, um, localization since everything is delocalized, the charge density is delocalized, we tend to overbind. Okay, so this is important to understand. If you use LDA, 
you tend to have um, um, lattice parameters that are underestimated because everything is bonding more than it should because all the charge is evenly spread out. So you underestimate par lattice parameters and volumes, and you tend to overestimate cohesive energies, elastic moduli, phonon frequencies, et cetera. The next step of the ladder is using the generalized gradient approximation, where the exchange correlation term not only depends on the charge density, but also the derivatives. Okay, and this generally improves the situation, but it can overcompensate. Um, there's some there's some important variants that exist in the that, that people use a lot in the literature. There's a parameter free GGA that was developed by Purdue and Wang in '91. And then there's the simplified GGA developed by Purdue, Wang, and uh, Erzenhoff. And this is the standard for intermetallic solids. Okay, this PBE uh, um, uh, uh, pseudopotential and exchange correlation functional. This is really the standard for intermetallics. The next step of the wrong uh, uh, step of the ladder is meta GGAs, where we now no we don't include just the local density, we include the derivatives and also the second derivatives. Okay, and these are much more expensive. Um, and then we have hybrid functionals, where we can include a portion of exact, exact exchange from Hartree Fox. So if you remember, well, I, I mean, if you for those of you that took solid state, you know that if you derive uh, the Hartree Fox equations, that you actually nail down in terms of the exchange and correlation terms, you actually you can actually solve solve the exchange uh, exactly. Um, and so you can incorporate pieces of that ex exact exchange into our functionals. It makes it much more expensive. Um, one of the more important ones in the in the literature is is, is one developed by uh, Beck, Lee, Yang, and Parr, which is called B B three lip. It's three a three parameter function where these three parameters are fitted from experiment. So not only is it a hybrid functional, but it's also an empirical function, right? So these are these terms that I want you to be aware of in case you're reading in the literature, and it's the standard for molecules. Um, I've been giving this picture of these runs of the ladder. Uh, John Perdue came up with this very nice picture for for um, for uh, ex ex modeling exact uh, exchange and 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 correlations. So at the bottom of the rung, we have LDA. We 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 step it up. We go to GGA. As you go up the rung, you're getting more expensive, but hopefully you're also getting more accurate. It's not necessarily always the case, but that's that's the idea here. You can go up to meta GGAs. Meta hybrid GGAs, fully non-local, and in 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 the in the top rung, which is where we want to be in heaven, where everything you have perfect chemical accuracy. Um, uh, and I give some some examples here in the slides of some of these acronyms that you'll see, which is a big acronym soup. There's a lot of different ways that people have created these exchange correlation functions. Okay, so let's go to these some of these exercises. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to share. Um, my full screen because we're going to go over to the uh, the cluster and we're going to actually work with some of these files here. So let me stop sharing and then I'm going to share my full screen. Okay, one second. So I want to get both uh, both pieces on. Let me share. Okay. Okay, so uh, can I get a thumbs up if you can see my screen here with my slides, and then if you can see my uh, browser here on the on the side. If I get uh, if I get that confirmation, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, can we see? Visible. Looks, looks good. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much for confirming. Okay. You might so, want to make a terminal window a bit bigger. Uh, the term. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Absolutely. One second. Definitely. Okay. So we went through, um, well, we, we had a, um, I know that Dr. Esther shared some slides about how to work with the terminal. I'm going to assume that you, you're very familiar with working the terminal. You know how to use CD, LS, et cetera. Um, so, um, but I'll go slow nonetheless, and, and, and hopefully people have questions, they can, they can post them on the chat, and some of my, my colleagues can help out with that if you have questions with it. So if you do LS at, at, in home, you should see a, a directory there called um, A-Flow Exercises. So we're going to go inside there. So you're going to see the into A-Flow Exercises using tab complete if you can, because uh, it's, it's very useful. Go inside, you're going to do LS. 
And you'll see that there's the command line prompter, which, which Dr. Esther shared for, for, for everyone to do on their own. And then you're going to go into day one. LS. We're going to go into part one. Part one. Oh, one second. Zero, uh, zero one, part one. So you're going to see the into there. Okay. And you should see two uh, uh, directories here. I also want to mention that uh, important for the exercises later, I include so, uh, some snapshot from Lat uh, Ashcroft and Merman about the, um, the different lattices that you're going to be working with because we're going to build some structure files. And then I include a publication um, uh, that, that was done by the group, which, which talks about the, the, different, um, the different paths that we take along our, our case space uh, in order to build our, our band structures. Okay, but for now we're gonna go inside of um, we're gonna go inside of one energy. Everything is numbered, so right now you should just follow everything that's one. We're gonna go into one aluminum, and then you're gonna go into one standard conventional. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> the first example here is um, we're going to uh, one second. We're going to build. Okay, so in here, I've included the in car, which is the input file for VASP. This is going to contain um, all of the settings for our run. I'm going to I'm going to show you uh, some specifics inside of the in car. It's not going to be too relevant for today because we're not going to be running VASP. But the, ex the example here, and then we're going to follow up with the exercises. We want to create the post car, which stands for positions. And it's really the geometry file for our crystal. And then we're going to build our K points file. Um, and we're going to build one that has a grid that's 10 by 10 by 10. Okay. So let's, uh, so first, before, um, before we do this, um, I'm just going to show you quickly um, the in car. I'm not going to talk too much in specifics because it's not too relevant today. But for those of you that are going to be using VASP, we specify some, uh, our system name. Um, we want to perform a density functional theory relaxation. And that's specified by Ibrion 2 here. So we're going to relax with a conjugate gradient uh, um, uh, algorithm. We want it to relax. We want, it, we want to allow the ions to relax 51 times, which is specified there. And we're going to specify how this relaxation is going to be done. So we want to relax the forces, the stress tensor, position, cell shape, and cell volume all at the same time. You can actually fix some of these parameters so you can fix... So you just relax along um, or, with the or, well, Jonathan, There is some requests for increasing the font size and- uh, Oh, okay. Thank you. I can do that. Yeah, let me put the chat. Thank you for reminding me. Let me see how I do this. Can Maybe I- do first try to make a terminal window full screen inside of virtual machine. Yeah, I'm doing that now. Thank you for the suggestion. Okay. Is that, is that better? I hope that's better now. I may have lost part of my, one second. Okay. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so I hope that's better. Yeah, okay, much better. Good, good, good. Um, L orb, okay, so I was talking, so you can actually do, uh, you can specify how you relax. L orbital equals 10. This gives us, we wanna know the spin decomposition, how much of it is, is S, how much is D, how much is F. Um, we want to specify the number of bands. Remember, I told you that um, this is very important for our um, periodic systems. This is N, that term that I, I showed you in the slides earlier. We have to specify that by hand. We generally want something that is going to be greater than, but on the order of the number of electrons in the system. The reason we want to be num greater than is because we need to have some orbitals which are not filled. And since you don't know necessarily know a priori how many orbitals are going to be filled, how many are not, you want to specify something greater than the number of electrons. And if you don't do that, VASP will actually spit out an error. Um, we want to symmetrize our, um, our K grid. So we're going to turn on uh, symmetry within VASP. Uh, I'm not going to worry about these. These are just telling us which files we want to write out. So we can actually turn them on and off whether we want VASP to actually write that output file. Uh, precision equals accurate is very important because this actually specifies um, how big our, um, our it, it implicitly defines how big our uh, basis set's going to be if we don't provide additional parameter, which we do. 
we provide EM max. Now, this is the energy cutoff that I talked about earlier in the slides. This is going to fix our basis set size, okay? And this is going to depend on the pseudo potential. VASP gives some defaults, and then we take those defaults and we multiply them by 1.4. This is a parameter which has been tested, you know, many, many times, and it seems to work very well. EDIF specifies the convergence criteria for our iteration when we're solving for our solutions. So we want to make sure that the solution which we plug into our operator and that which we get back from our eigenvalues is converged within one times 10 to the six. And then this, this, uh, these two parameters here are important because we, we might have a metal and converging the solution for metal is a problem, uh, algorithmically speaking. So when you have when you're trying to converge the solution for the um, for the for a metal, because the metal doesn't have a clear band gap, you're actually gonna you might have electrons which switch back and forth between different op between different orbitals, and this is going to slow down convergence. So what we do is that we give it we allow the electrons to exist sort of fractionally. Okay, so we allow electrons to be partially in one orbital and partially in another. It's not it's not physical, but it actually allows us uh, um, computationally to to reach a solution for our, for our orbitals very quickly. So this is this is purely for computation. Okay, it's not a physical parameter. Okay, so those the in car settings. Those are some of the important ones. Um, we're going to build the postcard. And we're going to do this together and the K points file. So. Um, I actually give some hints here. Um, I tell you that aluminum is an FCC structure and I actually give you the lattice parameters. You can actually get this from Wikipedia or from our website. Okay, I walk through what the NCAR is. Um, if we were running VASP, you would also need to have the pod car. We don't have it today because we're not gonna be running VASP, but I just wanna show you that the pod car here, you see it's Paul PBE. So this is this projector augmented wave function method with the flavor of Purdue, Burke, and Eisenhoff, uh, Earth, Eisenhoff um, uh, the flavor that I, I described earlier. So this is for aluminum. And you can see here within the, the pot car, we also specify the EN max, which uh, there's a default for VASP. And then we specify one that is 1.4 times that. Okay, and you'll see that information um, it written in here to the pod car. We don't have that file today because we're not going to be running VASP. But just so you know, this is what that, that file contains. It contains that pseudo potential information. Okay, so let's build the geometry file for our FCC lattice. Um, we know that the lattice vectors for a standard conventional representation of FCC looks like this. Our lattice vector one is the lattice vector in the X direction and one lattice vector completing the X direction. A2 is a lattice vector of size of that of, of A, which is you know 4.05, I gave that earlier, and it's all along the Y. And then the third lattice vector is uh, all along the Z. Okay, very simple. That's the lattice vectors. Those are the lattice vectors. We also have a basis of atoms within that lattice. And so here I give you the picture. There are really four atoms that are unique within this picture. We have the corner here, which specifies all of the other corners. So we have one at zero, zero, zero at the origin. We have another one, which is offsetted by one half of one lattice vector, and then one half of the other lattice vector, okay? And you can see that we have all of the different variants, okay? One half, one, uh, lattice vector one plus one half lattice vector three, and then one half times lattice vector two and one half times lattice vector uh, three, okay? So that specifies the locations of the atoms within the lattice vector, within the, lat sorry, the, the unit cell. So this is how we build our postcard, okay? So let's go ahead and we're gonna, we're gonna open up. I'm gonna use VI. Um, if you wanna use G-Edit, there is G-Edit on this, on this cluster, correct? Yes. Yes, okay, so I'm gonna use VI, um, but if, if, you're, if you're interested in using G-Edit, um, you should be able to um, open up, let's see, the file system here. And we don't need this many. You should be able to open it up here. Um, go to the desktop. How do I go home? Let's go, go to home. service. Place service. Is service. Perfect. Go home, and then you're going to see A flow exercises. You're going to go into day one. 
So we click inside to the directory we're in, go into aluminum, go into, just keep clicking one. And here, if you right click, uh, you should be able to create a document, an empty file. And we're gonna call it postcard, create, and I'm gonna open up that file with gedit. Okay, so now I should be able to edit it, right? Yes, perfect, okay. So actually I'll, I'll use this, uh, this editor here. It's just a little simpler. Okay, so uh, the first line for the postcard, everybody should be doing this with me. You're gonna specify the first line is just the comment line. So it's just the name of the system. Let's put aluminum. It's not important for the calculation. We're gonna hit enter. The second line is the scaling factor. We're not gonna worry about that right now, but we're gonna plug in 1.0 because it's the scaling factor for the rest of the lattice vectors, okay? Now, the next three lines are the lattice vectors written one after another, okay, as rows. Think of this as like a matrix, and the rows are each of the lattice vectors. So the lattice vectors here, I told you that the first one is all along X, and that the magnitude is that of 4.05. So I'm going to write 4.05, and then 0 0.0, 0 0.0, okay? Because it's all along the X, X, Y, and Z, okay? We're going to go to the second one. It's all along the Y. So I'm going to do 0, 0.0. Then I'm going to do 4.05 and then 0, 0.0. I'm going to change the spacing here so that you can actually really see the matrix construction. Okay. And then the last one is all along the Z. So it's the same thing. 4.05. Okay. The next line tells me the number of atoms in the basis. Okay, I already told you that there are four atoms, so you're gonna write four. The next line tells you how you're gonna specify these uh, coordinates in, uh, um, in space. We're gonna write direct. Okay, the only letter, the only thing that matters here is the capital D. That's the only thing that VASP is gonna pick up. And direct coordinates is gonna be, you're gonna see why it's so convenient and why it's better than specifying the coordinates in Cartesian. Um, so I'm going to go, okay, so I'm going to specify the coordinates and I'm going to show you why it's so nice to specify them in direct. So the first one is at the origin. So the origin is always 0.0, 0.0, .0 and 0 0.0. Okay. Um, the next one is one half times the first coordinate plus one half times the second coordinate. And uh, what that looks like is 0 0.5 for A1, 0 0.5 for A2, and then 0, 0.0, okay? So what does this tell me? I just have to take the coefficient here, and then each of these three numbers is corresponds to uh, which lattice vector I refer to. So 0 0.5 times this lattice vector, and then plus 0.5 times this lattice vector gives me the exact coordinates in space that this atom sits. But it's a very condensed, very easy way to write it out. That's what direct specifies. Um, now, if you, if you follow along, you're going to see how I'm going to build the third atom, which is 1 half A1 plus 1 half A3. So it's 1 half times A1, 0 for A2, and then 1 half times A3. Very simple, just, just putting in the coefficients. And then the last one is one half A2 plus one half A3. So there's no A1, there's one half A2 and then one half A3. That makes sense, any questions? I think that's pretty simple. Given these coordinates and this and these lattice vectors, the direct space, the specifying things by direct is very easy, okay? So I'm gonna hit save. Hey, that's our postcard. And I'm going to close that out. The next thing we want to do, um, okay, I already showed you how to build that. Um, the next thing we want to do is build the K points file. I'm giving you the answer here, but let's go ahead and uh, um, create a document. We're going to call it K points. And we're going to open that up. And I'm going to tell you how to build the K points file. So the first, the, the top line is again, a comment line. So it doesn't matter. We're gonna, we're gonna put K points and then I'll put AL. That's, you know, follow along with me, but that, that first line is, is not really necessary. The next line specifies uh, the number of K points and we're gonna specify zero because zero tells VAS that we're gonna do an automatic scheme. Okay, remember I told you there was two ways. You can either feed in the path you want 
or you can do automatic generation. So we're going to tell it that we want VAST to do the work of generating the grid for us. So we're going to specify zero for the number of K points. Now we tell it which grid scheme we want to build. And uh, since we have an FCC, we definitely want to use a gamma centered grid. So we just put gamma there. Then we want to tell it how many, uh, um, how big this grid is going to be in every direction. So we're going to do 10, 10, 10. And then the last line specifies an optional sh uh, shift in the mesh. Now this shift comes intrinsically uh, when we have a Moncourt PAX uh, symmetry because, or um, uh, specification because it's shifted away from gamma. In this case, we want to be focused on the origin and we don't want to specify a shift. So we're just going to write zero, zero, zero. That's it. And this specifies our K points for our run here. Okay, we're going to hit save and we're going to close this out. All right, so um, the next step that we're going to do together is um, now we don't, we're not going to run VASP today. But what I've done is I've given you, um, I've given you what the run looks like. So imagine that we're, you know, we're on a cooking show. I give you, I show you how the ingredients look, and then I'm going to show you what the final result looks like. So we're going to go inside of run, and you'll see here that we have um, the runs uh, here, uh, all of the output files. We have the input files, and we have all the output files. Now, let me see. Can I just open up this? No, I cannot. So what we're going to have to do here. We're going to go back to our terminal. And let me, uh, let me move this terminal up here. We're going, to, we're going to go back to our terminal, hit S, LS. You're going to see we have the two new files that we specified earlier. You're going to go CD inside of run. And you're going to run the command XZ minus D. You're going to write concar. We want the out car two. And I don't remember if there was one oh, one second. Out car dot XZ. Was there, an, oh, and then the Aussie car, yes. Okay. Uh, set the file group. Looks like I cannot change uh, the, uh, I can't, I can't, okay, let me do this here like this. So it looks like I'm having some permission issues. So I'm gonna exit cat the cot car first, okay? Oh, one second. Am I in the right place? Oh, it did it. Okay, never mind. It worked. It gave it gave us the errors, but it looked like it worked. So let me cat out the con car. Okay, here we have our results. You can follow along with me here on the screen. I just want to show you. Okay, so remember, so the con car is the final postcard. So we specified our geometry file with the postcard. Now we're going to do our relaxations with DFT. It's going to move the ions to the minimum energy configuration. The con car specifies where the atoms are after all of the relaxation. So let's take a look at this file. It's the same as the postcar. It has a few extra lines here, but we're not going to worry about these. These are the velocities after the relaxation. Don't worry about that. This is effectively the postcar we had earlier. Okay. We have our scaling factor. That's one. Don't worry about it. But look, we basically have our lattice vectors before we had 4.05 written there. Now we have 4.04 .04 and change. So you can see that the lattice actually shrunk. And then we have our direct coordinates and the direct coordinates actually did not change, okay? You can take a look at the postcard if you wanna verify it for yourself, but the positions within the unit cell did not change for the atoms. The relaxation fundamentally just shrunk the volume of the cell. So that is, so simply by shrinking the volume of the cell with respect to the one that we built earlier, um, this gives us a DFT relaxed lattice parameter, a new one. So instead of 4.05, we see that DFT, the minimum energy configuration is 4.04 .04 and change. Okay. So um, well, let's look at the Aussie car. So I'm going to cut out the Aussie car here. Sorry, sorry um, for interrupting one more time. Uh, if anybody gets an invitation to a breakout room, please ignore them. I have to recreate them all. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Esther. Yes, just in case you're having issues with the VM, we'll work it out. No problem. Go ahead and meet with him in the, in the I guess it's breakout room seven, right? Um, okay. Otherwise, if you're running, if you're following along, um, here is the Aussie car. Now, remember, I told you that this is going to contain these iterative uh, steps in how we solve our solution. 
So what's going on here in the big picture? You see that we have, we broadly speaking, have three big chunks of, of data. Okay, we have one, two, three. Now these three big trunk chunks are the ionic steps. So what we're gonna do, what VASP does is that it's gonna put the ions where it's gonna, you know, you feed in where the ions sit. It's gonna figure out what the electronic uh, um, orbitals look like. It's gonna solve for the ionic, uh, sorry, solve for the electronic orbitals with the ions fixed. And then given the energy of the system, it's gonna move the ions. So these are three steps that it took that it moved the ions. So within these ionic steps, these three ionic steps, we have a number of electronic steps of, of converging the orbitals, the cone sham orbitals with that particular configuration. So you see for the first one, it took 10 ionic steps where it fixed the, the operator, solved the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, then it plugged it back into the operator and you do this, this iterative step. So these are the electronic uh, steps. Then you have the, uh, then you move the ions and then you keep doing until you, you, you converge your system um, uh, to within the parameters we specified in the ionic step. And you can see here, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus six here, 10 to the minus six. These are the, uh, so, okay, we, I didn't tell you what the columns are. This is the number of steps. This is the energy of the system. This is the change of the energy of the free energy um, with respect to the last step. This is the change in the band structure energy. Um, and we're not going to worry about these. These are not really important, but these are other parameters. Um, you, you can see here that um, this is the number of evaluations that was required for the Hamiltonian acting on the wave functions. Um, NGC uh, RMS is the norm residual for the trial from re with respect to the trial wave functions. Um, but we're not going to worry about those. Those are, those are, we really want to focus on DE. And you can see that DE has to be less than one times 10 to the five, which is what we specified as our convergence criteria. Okay. So there we, there you have it. Okay. So, uh, the last thing I'm going to show you for this is the, um, the outcar. Um, so we're going to cat the outcar. You can just follow along with me on the screen here. Um, some important pieces, the most important pieces of the outcar, outcar, which is the real big output file, are written at the bottom. Here we have um, the, the total time for the calculation. Okay, this is going to be something that's going to be important um, for, for if, we, if we're able to get to it in our exercises. Um, we have our, um, if you scroll up, uh, what you're looking for, actually, I might have passed it. One second. Okay, it's right here. Um, well, we, the, the really big, uh, most important information is right here, the free energy of the ion electron system. It's the last one. And what we're looking for is this number here, the energy without entropy. This is the final energy of the system after it's done its, its relaxation. Okay. Um, the sigma tells us, be, this is actually an important quantity because it tells us as sigma, which is an input parameter for um, we had to do that smearing for the electrons for a partial occup uh, occupancy of the of the electrons within the orbitals. This is kind of an, uh, to, to, this kind of shows us how how if this number is very different than this number, then it tells us that the system had issues with um, with putting uh, electrons in one orbital or the other. It had really big issues, and so that smearing we want to see we want to reduce the smearing as much as possible because it's not very physical. You can see here the forces on the cell after all of the uh, the runs, and these are the forces. Here, here we go. These are the forces on the atoms after the, uh, the relaxation. We since if we're really at the minimum, we should have no forces. Okay, so the second derivative should be um, all, well, all the derivatives should be zero at the minimum. So you can see here that this was well converged. Okay, um, yeah, and that's that's it. That's those are the important pieces for VASP. Um, we're going to go to our breakout rooms. This is really, uh, um, this is the exercise we're going to be able to do together. I just want, so in the breakout rooms, I'm going to show what we, what we want everybody to do. Um, so what we're, so you're going to come out of, we're going to come out of run and you're going to come out of one standard conventional. And I want you to, to go into two standard primitive. Okay. Do LS. And you're going to see that, um, oh, 
little frozen. Okay. So you're going to see you're going to have a bunch of directories, different K point specifications. You're going to want it to, together as a group in your breakout room, start with K points 10 by 10 by 10. Okay. And what you want to do inside of that directory is that you want to, um, you're going to want to run. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to build your postcard for this new representation of aluminum in the FCC lattice. So we built one that's called the standard conventional. We're now going to build one in the standard primitive representation. And you're going to talk about in your small groups why this is so important in terms of time. It's going to reduce by having a smaller representation. It's going to reduce down the time needed for VAS to do the calculations. Um, and you're going to see how, it, how the energies are going to differ now because you're going to have one, one atom. Um, but all of the runs, all of the DFT data is written inside of the run. So for this, when all together, you're going to build the postcard and then you're going to analyze how the energies and the different lattice parameters change as you change the K-point, the K-point grid. So the solution at the end is you hope that as you increase the K-point grid, your lattice parameters and your energy could start to converge, but that they're going to be really, there's going to be really big differences in the beginning when you have a one or two K-points specified. Okay, so I give you, you can do this in your small groups, but I tell you what the lattice vectors look like for the standard primitive. And I tell you that there's only one atom in the basis, which is at the origin. Okay, so we're going to break out for our breakout rooms and we'll stay there for uh, five or 10 minutes. We'll see how it runs. We'll come back together and we'll talk about some of the results and then we'll break after that. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to our breakout rooms. I'll stop sharing here. All right, let's give a few minutes for everyone to come back. And then I'm just going to make some, some small uh, announcements about, about this lecture, and then we'll conclude for a break. Mm, sir, we have joined the exercise session, and we find there that uh, uh, with the increase of the supercells, uh, the time, uh, CPU time increases, and also with the number of uh, increase of the number of K points, uh, the, we, we are getting more uh, accurate energy, but here the CPU time is uh, quite large. So yeah. we have to uh, uh, test the optimal K points uh, to achieve the convergence. So convergence achievement is another factor. Yes, so yes, Ab absolutely. The, the, the K points, is a some okay when you look in the literature you should always make sure that the properties with which that people are reporting have they've they've done tests for convergence that's very important what i will say is that there are some very important criteria or heuristics that we've created based on our you know our, our history with dft and number of runs that we've created we have some criteria some heuristics for how to define the k-point grid a priori. And assuming that you have a grid that is at least as dense as that heuristic, you should be in the right ballpark. Now, Dr. Hicks is going to talk about that criteria in the next session. Um, but this is this fundamentally, these heuristics come from what's called the A flow standard for DFT calculations. So we have a number of these sort of heuristics. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk more about uh, how to define them. And once you've defined them, how they work, and and and, uh, and and that's it. But if you run with A-flow, these things are done automatically. So it's very simple. Okay. Uh, 
Hi, hi, Bengal. It's good to see you again. Um, I think uh, I think uh, Dr. Essers is dealing with some of these uh, technical issues, along with maybe someone from. Uh, I'm about to uh, assign a breakout room. Uh... Go for it. Um, I think everyone's returned back, um, so I'm just going to make uh, some quick announcements. Um, so we we I, I provided a number of exercises. I mean, really more than the time is allowed. For this presentation, you know, we have, we have very short time windows, but I provided a number of example uh, um, exercises for you to run through in the slides that you have. So, um, you know, feel free to run through those examples. The next exercise that you would have run through is one where you actually calculate the energies uh, for a, um, uh, I think it's for iron, and you'll see how you can do this with different lattices. And you'll see that if you turn spin on, spin is an important parameter in, in VASP, whether you turn spin on or off is gonna be a very important um, uh, parameter in terms of determining what is the, the minimum energy structure. And so if you don't turn spin on or, or, you, or you do, that's gonna have major implications on, on what the structure should be for iron. And we know that iron is magnetized. So you can run through that exercise uh, on your own later or maybe in the break. If you have any questions, I'll put my email there and you can, you can email me. And then the last exercise has to do with calculating the density of states and finally the band structure. We're gonna touch on this a bit more after the break with Dr. Hicks um, because he's gonna show you how, how uh, you can actually construct this automatically with A-Flow. So we'll have an opportunity to go through that afterwards. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to put my email address in the, um, in, the, uh, in the chat here. And if anyone's running through the exercises on their own and they have any questions, feel free to email me and I'm happy to help. Uh, otherwise, uh, unless there's any questions here, I will conclude the session. Uh, thank you for your time. And, uh, and we'll, we'll break here and then we'll pick it up again. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you the time on the Eastern Standard Time. We'll, we're going to meet again at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, which is uh, um, 1900 hours in, in Dresden uh, for session part two of session one, which is AFLO plus DFT with Dr. Hicks. Um, thank you very much for your time and, and uh, yeah, enjoy your break.